Hello everyone! I'm really excited to film this review today. I am going to be reviewing the debut studio album by Swedish artist entity. Don't really know how else better to describe her. I am, am I, who am I? Um, also known as Yona Lee, um, as her real name. It's not a band necessarily, but it is an art collective, although she and Clay Bjorklund, also known as Barbell, are the ones working on the music for the I Am, Am I, Who Am I tracks. This is an audiovisual project. The visuals are just as important as the music, although the music definitely stands on its own. This album was not released physically as an album until June of 2013, three years after all of the, almost all of the audio uh, visual elements were already released. Before these videos were released, um, I Am, Am I, Who Am I kind of introduced themselves very enigmatically and very anonymously to the world via a series of six one and a half minute videos called Preludes. These had snippets of songs that we might come to hear in later tracks, um, just some instrumental visual kind of teasers for the imagery and conceptual nature of the story arc of I Am Am I, Who Am I's visuals, particularly for Bounty. These were released in the er winter, early spring of 2010, and then the first track, B, Out of Bounty, was aired in March of 2010, with the final one, Y, being aired in August of 2010, and then two other tracks being released in 2011, John and Clump, respectively, which were then lumped together as a part of the Bounty project. Now, of course, the titles for that tracks of Bounty all spell out the word Bounty. We have B, we have O, we have U1 and U2, not the band, but yes, U is split into two parts. N, T, and Y. There is a small little interlude track called 2010-11-4, I believe. It's just basically the date that that song was released on the internet. Um, the video, it's very short. It's only like a minute, minute and a half. Um, and there is a little vocal snippet here of a song called Shadow Show, which will be featured on I'm just going to abbreviate and say I am because it's really a mouthful to say I am, am I, who am I every time. So when I say I am, you know what I mean? That'll be featured on I am's uh, Blue project, which will come in 2014. So I am completely new as of recently to I am's music and Yona's music. I got into her through her most recent release as a solo artist, Yana Lee, Everyone Afraid to Be Forgotten, which I reviewed on this channel about a month ago. The album is phenomenal. I highly recommend you check it out. I'm sure everyone who's watching this video already knows about it, so I'm preaching to the choir here. This is an artist who I had vaguely in the very peripheral of my like internet searchings had heard of. Her name was familiar to me. That's a very iconic name. I am, am I, who am I? Really, and I knew that she was an enigmatic sort of audiovisual artist who just sort of dropped songs mysteriously out of thin air. And I knew that she was from like somewhere Nordic. I didn't know if it was Sweden, but I knew it wasn't. Um, I knew she was European. Um, but the reason is because I follow Curly. She's an Estonian singer-songwriter who is phenomenal, who I think a lot of due comparison can be made between Curly's visuals and Yana I Am's visuals. And so I had heard her name thrown around, and I just never, for whatever reason, decided to pay any attention. And I am so in some ways frustrated that I didn't, you know, actually live through the release of Bounty or Kin or Blue um, in the moment, you know, it would have been really cool to see as each episode in some ways was aired. That's kind of how she did these. She just released them one by one as she was working on these songs. It would have been cool to kind of live that experience. However, I get the benefit of being able to see all of these almost all at once. I could just sit down and watch on the computer all of Bounty within the space of an hour, which it took, year, you know, almost a year for everyone else to sort of fully see the whole picture. So getting it all in one fell swoop is a very different experience than having it dragged out and, you know, filling in all these details as you go. I don't know which is a better way, or to be honest, which is a better way to experience this music. Um, I'm definitely glad I'm on board the train, finally, because um, I don't think that she's done making music, although it has been a bit since she's collaborated as I Am, since her latest release was more on her own. But you still see the through lines to all of her music. She samples some of the preludes that come through from beginning of Bounty in 
Iona Lee's new album, in particular songs Gone and Like Hell. Now I understand what the significance of the Like Hell lyrics are, which I think is quite phenomenal now, and it makes, I think, Like Hell a much more elevated track now in my mind on that album. In my album review, I describe Like Hell as a little bit forgettable in the rest of their album. And now, I mean, yes, sonically it's not the most interesting, but I do find the fact that it ties all the way back to 2010 so interesting and so integral to a sort of story that she is forming here. Now what that story is is what I want to spend a lot of time talking about in this video because, oh my goodness, is she a... <laughs> She is an enigmatic artist, and I've been to art school. I, um, I've seen a lot of avant-garde art films in my time, um, and this was definitely one of the ones I think that was more tasteful. Um, I've seen now all of her visuals, so the only things I haven't seen are her concerts. I do need to watch those, but um, as far as Bounty, because that's what I'm talking about today, um, I feel like I have the most to say. I feel like Bounty visually is one of her strongest projects um, in terms of aesthetic and in terms of art value and also in terms of things to unpack and analyze. It's very rich and very detailed and complex. Not to say that her later visuals aren't, but they do get, especially if we're talking like Blue, for example, they do get a little bit more cinematic and sweeping, which is which is beautiful and, and it's very meditative and calming, but there is a little bit of that uh, more serene sort of uh, model photo shoot kind of aesthetic going on rather than something that's meant to kind of disturb or almost creep you out. There's something very creepy about the bounty visual set that is disturbing, but in a good way. It's not something that's gonna, you know, make you want to turn it off, but it's just unsettling enough to keep you on the edge of your seat, to keep you not knowing what's going to come upon the screen next. And the melodies complement that beautifully. The melodies composed are some of the darker, murkier songs that she has composed as this collective. They're a lot less in your face, um, and they're definitely not instant grabs. They're something you have to sit with for a while. Almost all of the songs on Bounty, the first time I heard them, I gotta be honest, I didn't quite know what to make of them. The, the music kind of flew over my head. I mean, I definitely did not understand much of the lyrics. The way she vocally distorts her voice a lot of the time and speaks very fast or in a sort of muffled sort of soundscape makes it hard to understand her lyrics. So I kind of just didn't pay any attention to the lyrics, except things that happened to just come through. And I just sort of like let it all kind of wash over me. I didn't, I knew that the songs itself would take repeated listens to become something that I'd actually be able to sing along to, something that I'd be able to keep in my head and remember what it sounded like after it was over. And I will say that now I have seen at least the full series twice, but I've seen several videos more than that. And I've listened to a lot of the songs more than that. Um, I do have a lot of standouts. Um, I do really find all of the music to be elevated with repeated listens, as most artists who are anything worth discovering, I find to be, are the fact. That was a very Yoda sentence. That made no sense. Bear with me. I'm going to try and strew together some sort of cohesive thought here. This is very difficult because it's so rich and there's so much to unpack and I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, first of all, I want this video to sort of start a thread, so if anyone in the comments might have more info, um, they've been with I Am for a lot longer, they probably already have their own theories about what the meanings of these videos are, please comment what your thoughts are. I really want to read them because I was, I mean, I love seeing the comments on their YouTube videos, but there's not enough people, I feel like, unpacking them. I mean, you have to really search on the internet, and that's the beauty of this thing, but, you know, it'd be nice to just, like, start a sort of little, you know, uh, decoder community, because you could go down the rabbit hole with these videos and visuals and with the lyrics. The lyrics are also, now that I've actually gone through and read them, quite something else. And sometimes it may seem a little bit like the lyrics don't have anything to do with the visuals. And I think that's because sometimes the lyrics are a little bit more open and not so distinct, not to say that they're vague by any means, but they're not describing a specific situation. They're very existential. They're very broad concept. And so the videos are so specific, so detailed, um, so nuanced that it will make a bit of a disconnect at first. But you kind of then have to just, like I said, analyze deeper, research deeper, and sort of understand the overarching concepts and emotions that IM's music is delving into. 
Each track starts with the sound of an animal that makes a little bit of a similar sound to the pronunciation of a letter from the word bounty. That may sound crazy, but for example, the song O starts with an owl call. And if you watch the preludes, at the end of each prelude, there's a little sketch of an animal that represents each of the six, well, it's actually, it's actually seven because U is split into two parts, um, but six letters. Um, you actually kind of make that correlation yourself. When the preludes were released, they didn't have titles that were um, alphabetical, they were numeric. They were long streams of uh, numbers, which some very smart decoder discovered that they corresponded to a letter in the alphabet. When you translated all of the preludes, they sort of spell out, I'm not sure if this is the correct order, educational, I am, it's me, mandragora aficionarum, welcome home. That's quite an interesting uh, statement. So first of all, we've got to unpack the, and then, like as I said, the goat, the owl, whale, bee, llama, and monkey are the six animals that tie into each of the six songs. Again, U is tied in two, so it's technically seven. And you hear the sound of that animal at the very beginning of each song. And for instance, um, a whale song makes a bit of a U sound. Uh, a goat makes a, bah, so it's a B sound. If you, if you put, Ba ooh, whale sound, B, Z. It's a bit of an N sound there. A llama with a T, I don't know how the T ties into llama. And a monkey, which makes a bit of a Y sound, you get bounty. We have to unpack what a mandragora is, which was something I had to do a lot of research on. And I was very fascinated. If you look at the videos, particularly the videos for O and the video for Y, you see a plant in a planter, which comes to be described as a mandrake. Now, for any Harry Potter fans out there, we're all familiar from mandrakes, probably from Harry Potter, when they have to, in herbology class, pull them out and they make this wailing sound and you have to plant them in a new pot really quick because the wailing could actually, in some folklore, actually kill you. Um, and that's the folklore that has been passed down through generations about the mandrake, which is used in a lot of herbal witchcraft sort of circles as a healing plant with a lot of magical properties. Even the preludes, we start to see, you know, the mud covered. It's not necessarily meant, and I know it does look a little bit like blackface, but I understood in the concept, it never really crossed my mind until afterwards. It's meant to be mud, even though it is pure black. Um, you know, Yona very heavily disguised at the beginning. We have to remember that at the time, no one knew that this was Yona behind the project. No one knew anything about where this was coming from. Fans had to actually uncover that themselves. And then eventually they did confirm that Yona Lee, who had actually released songs under her real name, which were very sort of more, very more traditional singer songwriter type fare, um, that she was the one who was actually disguised and used in the videos. So Mandragora officinarum is the Latin name for the mandrake. It is a plant native to the Mediterranean area. And the roots of the mandrake are very iconic. They sort of resemble a human figure. Um, they sometimes do look very figural. And so that has led a lot of people to believe that mandrakes have, you know, a special connection with humans. They are very poisonous plants and they are very hallucinogenic. So you have to be very careful if you're using them in any sort of um, potion. Uh, for example, um, the toxicity of the leaves and roots. It was used as an anesthetic in the Middle Ages um, for surgery. Um, you know, if in small doses, it's probably okay, but it is something that's very risky to use, I wouldn't recommend. And there was an ideology between female and male mandrakes. Um, the imagery surrounding the two and the look of them. So in Encyclopedia Mythica here, it says, the man who is to gather it must fly around it, must take great care that he does not touch it, then let him take a dog bound, let it be tied to it, which has been close, shut up, and has fasted for three days, and let it be shown bread and called from afar. The, draw the dog will draw it to him, the root will break, it will send forth a cry, the dog will find, fall down dead at the cry, which, which he will hear such virtue this herb has, that no one can hear it, but he must always die. And if the man heard it, he would directly die, therefore he must stop his ears and take care that he hear not the cry, lest he die as the dog will do. When one has this root, it is of great value for medicine, for it cures of every infirmity, except only death, where there is no help. 
So you're tricking basically a poor animal to be tied to this root for a, a certain amount of time and then luring it towards you and it pulls up the root in doing so. You're safe from hearing the cry, but the dog has done it itself and the dog will then die. Which is why we see the graves of what we presume to be dogs in the final prelude and we have a dog used in the imagery throughout a lot of these videos. The the folklore is sort of just used as I feel like a base thematic to build the visuals around. I don't necessarily think that the entire story is all about a mandrake. I think that she's just using that as a tool to describe the th emotional sort of concepts and themes that were meant to drive from these vi videos. Um, she does, you know, like disguise herself as one. The O video would be a perfect, the most obvious example of that, where she's in a greenhouse. Um, mandrakes would need to be in a greenhouse if you were in Northern Europe. They're a more kind of Mediterranean climate zoned kind of plant. And she um, shows, I mean, they have her eyes literally opening on the roots, which I think is one of the cooler visual effects that they use um, for these uh, songs and visuals. And a lot of people, fans, have speculated that the songs of I Am have come from the cry of the mandrake. Um, there is a male figure who is also shown in several of these videos, and a lot of people believe him to be the male aspect of the mandrake. Um, and so there's one scene where she is like a puppet made out of cardboard, and she's being sort of played with by a man in a diaper. Um, there's a lot of uh, warping effects on the camera to make things elongated like you would do on photo booth, which I think adds this very odd ambiance to the whole films, used in almost all of them. Um, and it's it's a very distorting kind of strange way to film something. I've never quite seen it used in that way, but it does add a big, very sur surrealistic layer to all of the visuals that it would not have otherwise if filmed through a normal lens. And the male character seems to be what I, now I'm just basically going to go in through my interpretation. This is if I had not read anything else online. My interpretation of the story is basically the mandrake, <laughs> this is so hard. Okay, so the mandrake is like a lot more primal and free. Um, there is a bit of a male versus female dichotomy thing going on where the male character, he searches for civilization. Um, he searches for the forbidden fruits of, you know, uh, greed and lust and power. And the cardboard castle that is featured in the U video is representative of that. You know, he's in the forest, um, sort of like an Adam and Eve figure um, from the Adam and Eve story. And he just stumbles upon this cardboard castle, which to him is like the ultimate treasure chest. There's all these goods within it. Um, which to me, you know, cardboard boxes symbolize materialism, um, storage, it symbolizes civilization, structure, it symbolizes anything that's basically not organic or natural, which the mandrake would ultimately represent, which Yana's version of the mandrake is portraying. You know, Yana always portrays herself as this muddied, organic character. So there becomes a little bit of a battle between the masculine a uh, power grabber, that version of the Mandrake, and the more feminine, natural Yona version, and the two interact. And it's just sort of, and they have this final so showdown in the Y video where she ends up killing the structured version, but, you know, through this very subdued sort of way. It's almost like subliminal. Um, there also are references to um, sperm, which again, this is where it gets very murky and confusing. I'm not entirely sure where the sperm comes in. I've heard people say that there's something about the sperm is how it plants the mandrake. Because it does look like he's sort of, uh, in several time in several scenes, jacking off. And, uh, that I guess would imply that he is, um, part of the reproductive process of the mandrake is doing that. I'm not entirely sure. This is why I want people to comment below and, you know, add their own input. We see Yana's character explore her surroundings. And for instance, a good example is the tea video where she, you know, comes out of the water and takes upon this crown and this scepter and this, you know, spherical, I mean, it's all made out of aluminum. Um, but that's just symbolic to represent authority, regality, um, and she marches through the forest and sort of stakes her claim there. 
um, in this unkept wilderness and then returns back to the ocean. So as she is, you know, exploring and discovering this world, the man built within, you know, the cardboard structure, um, he built a throne and sort of decided with all the white papers to rule over, you know, this new civilization. And so ultimately the female version of the Mandrake had to uh, revolt. And by doing so, she may have sacrificed herself. Um, it shows a baby being born at the end of Y, or it shows possibly through the whole version of Y, a baby being born. I'm not entirely sure um, because we have this aluminum forest, which is beautiful visually, and she seems to be birthed into it. But is this aluminum forest actually signifying a womb? Um, is this actually a place of conception that also destroys the male character that is, you know, domineering in the throne room? Because there's that little baby at the end, and it shows her sort of meeting it in this liminal space. And then at the very end, um, the man is hanging above a potted uh, pot of gravel that would it be where the mandrake new mandrake would grow and so then we have a new mandrake character growing that continues into the john clump and then kin series i feel a little bit crazy talking about all this this is just my interpretation of where i think the chronology of all these because i have been told that it is all chronological it all is supposed to make sense and even continuing into the kin era videos but there is so much to unpack and analyze. And for me, I love detail. I love complexity. I love murkiness. But I also don't always have to overanalyze everything. I'm sort of the type who just likes to bask in it. So as I view these videos, I have so many questions. But you know what? I would be okay if most of them never were answered. I do feel like some of the video imagery is meant to just be visually pleasing or visually interesting. And it's for art for art's sake. Which, you know, as an art student myself and as an artist, I can definitely appreciate and understand that we kind of make art for other people to interpret based on their own um, prejudices, their own objectivity. Um, and so we can't, you know, necessarily give a distinct meaning. I mean, Yo there's a reason why Yona doesn't talk directly about the direct meaning of her in her mind of what all this imagery and songs are about. She wants to keep that mystery. Uh, but overall, I mean, the Bounty series in terms of visuals, like I said, it just has this eeriness that is a bit removed from all of the others, though Kin has it to some extent as well. And again, I don't lament that she's lost that a little bit in her more recent work because I do love Blue. I think it's a little bit more solid and crisp, though I must admit, 2010 was a little bit before we got like a lot of HD videos on YouTube. I really wish the Bounty series could be uploaded in like 1080 HD on YouTube. It really deserves it um, because blue is so crystalline and HD and, you know, it's so luscious and colorful. And the colors are a little bit more subdued. There's a lot more neutrals. The imagery is not as flashy. There's not as much wide scale, you know, shots of things. It's a lot more close ups. We don't have sweeping vistas. We have close ups of you know, milk bottles and um, close ups on doors and coat hangers and a lot of imagery and symbolic um, object placement. And so it, it's a bit like a still life of symbology. <laughs> that's a word, um, which which is just different. It's not better or worse, but it's a different approach. But I still see the through lines of I Am's story and of course the art and cinematography. I still see the parallels. There's always that off-putting juxtapositional kind of imagery. There's always that disconnect between what you're seeing and what you're hearing and sometimes being a little bit unnerved by it. Um, it's not just a typical music video, and I love that about it. It's almost unlike anything I've really ever seen before, and that's what real art should be about. So let me talk now about each song track by track lyrically. With B, I must at first did not really recognize any sort of melody. It felt very pained and very shallow in her breath and performance. She's sort of just sitting at a keyboard wrapped in what looks like saran wrap, but it might be some sort of plastic or some sort of substance. Um, and she's with these two other men. I don't know if they're collaborators um, of this project. I, we don't really see them throughout the rest of the series in what looks to be like some form of wooden cabin. And everything feels very clean. Um, and yet at the same time, we can tell there's this sort of unease in the room. We see the black cat visual. 
which sort of leads us through, though we never hear the cat meow. It makes monkey sounds, it makes animal sounds that are not made from a cat, um, like a dog. And I'm like, I wanna hear cat meow because I love meows, but we do hear it's purring, which is I think quite comforting to hear. There it was, the land of decay. We should pack our things and run away. Rest in the quicksand, shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand. Sink slowly now, take flight. Like, let silence take this empty light. Take a deep breath as we go, wanting higher, wanting higher up. She sings this, as I said, in a very breathy, sort of hushed, different approach to a lot of her other sort of chorus, more belting kind of performances. It's very folksy. Um, it's, it's a little acoustic leaning and it's not heavily produced. And it's, it, it does feel very melancholic. I feel like this song, along with O oh and You, um, part one, are all so tragic in sound. They're very, very saddened. And even though there's these electronic beats underneath them, which are immaculate, by the way, Barbell's production is just, oh my God. I mean, the, the production and beat work in this electronica trance um, pop category that this music kind of fits itself in, if you were to classify it as a genre of music, is so infectious, but there isn't so much of a beat to be. It's more just setting a mood, creating a vibe. O is one of my favorites on this record because of just the sad but yet upbeat beat to it and melody. I thought I felt a spark. I thought I saw a flame. When something changed in you, who took the blame? My plan was foolproof as I became a fortress of your heart. Love, the kind that kills and scars, will make you kneel and cry to hell and back. The words that slit your throat will make you think of love as the new black, as what you lack, love. Think of love as the new black. This song is an ode to love, but the brutality of it, the brutality and wonder of what love will do to you. It will open you up and make you bloom and it will kill you just as the same. Um, the fact that she sings this as most personified as a mandrake as she'll ever be, um, she's literally standing in a pot amongst other mandrakes, um, signifies, you know, the nurture of some sort of plant that has either been neglected or not treated properly. And is, you know, she sings and it's like there's this drip coming down from a little glass jar and it's like she's yearning to be taken care of. Um, she's sort of underneath the structure away from the sunlight. The sunlight's only coming through in small pieces, like from a keyhole. Um, the lighting is very ominous and eerie. Um, there's this element of someone who's been neglected or forgotten and feels very forlorn and mistreated and is so reflecting on that in such a beautiful, tr tragic, triumphant at the same time way. Um, really beautiful song, excellent production, really gets under your skin. You Part One is probably the most eerie song she's ever made. She hot, she pitches her voice and I think reverses it a little bit in parts, like backwards, to create what sounds like a whale singing. Um, and as I said, in the visual, she's singing from like a puppet. And there's just something so haunting about it. There's something so personal about seeing a puppet made of yourself, I think, and having it sing. Um, it's like representing yourself in a much more emotional way than actually having you there, if that makes any sense. And it, it's like a pure lament. At the very beginning, she says in Spanish, a quien corresponda, which means to whom it may concern, the name of her label. You gave me life. In return, I'll just pretend. You watched it burn. In the trees of the autumn, in the shield of the old town, we would build it back down. You gave me life. We would build it back down. Such an interesting lyric. You know, uh, it makes no sense, but it, at the same time is perfect conceptually to understand of how we continually destroy. Um, in the visuals, you know, there's this cardboard castle that's in the middle of this pristine forest. Um, human nature is always geared to build it back down. And we will have to rebuild, you know, after man destroys everything or after nature has overcome, that is the rebuilding. And she personifies, as I said, I think the cry of Mother Earth. Um, and it's so beautiful. And I think it most clearly relates to the sort of understanding of the cry of the mandrake, especially because of how high pitched her vocals are. 
very eerie, very off-putting. There's this jarbled male vocal in the background, which adds this odd ambiance. So it's a bit of an ambient song. And it's a little bit more just like a prelude, but it is so beautiful. You two, not the band, you dash two, I know, it's very strange, um, is the sort of techno trance breakdown of this record. It's all it's saying is you can't be the night. And it doesn't mean night in as in N-I-G-H-T, K-N-I-G-H-T is what it means. You can't be the knight in shining armor. Um, and I think that's symbolic of, you know, at this point in the video, the male figure is exploring this cardboard civilization and he's wanting to control it. He's filled with ecstasy and joy at realizing, oh my gosh, you know, I have so much power here. I can control, I can compartmentalize, I can search for the forbidden fruits. Um, there's this bottle that's sitting in the middle of one of the rooms and he almost is trying to lick it like he can get to the water, but he's sort of held back and he's just sort of ecstatically dancing in a very sexual way. Um, and it is strange and bizarre, don't get me wrong, but that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to, and it's one of the most dance songs I Am's ever put out. I mean, this is pure house dance trance music. The production is flawless. Really recommend you listen to this in headphones because it overcomes you. And so N, N shows the Mandragora character interacting with this environment now. You know, um, there's this paper house uh, made out of paper and she's sort of uh, carrying these milk um, glasses. And if you've seen uh, Yana Lee's newest visual with the milk, I think there's a connection there. Um, milk sort of symbolizing like the Kool-Aid, you know, like drinking the status quo. Um, she starts out looking a bit like a salad um, <laughs> with like the lead bed of lettuce and everything saying, dress the part, it's storytelling time. Sharpen your knives, watering mouths. Clean your plates for some tender. Tell me how the story ends now. Come home, come see our place, our labyrinth to keep hiding. We push the boundaries so the rules are bent, just in time. Come wallow in my sorrow, breathe your air into my lungs. What hides in my shadow, my worst fear is real life. Tell me how the story ends now. My worst fear is real life. Never a truer lyric has been spoken. I'm getting a sense of, again, just the overall arcing story of this character, the female part of it, trying to live in this new environment that's not so natural, it's not so organic, that is more commodified, that is more wrapped up in aluminum foil and served to you um, as a commercialized product. And she is sarcastically sort of poking fun in it, you know, um, come see our hiding place uh, where the rules are all bent. Uh, clear the plates, come wallow in my sorrow. Um, so she's very unhappy in this situation. And so at the very end of the video, she walks out with all of these bottles taped to her body and she walks away from the civilization and sort of says, I'm not going to live in this world with this, this guy, you know, he's, he's still, he's gone that route and I don't want to be there. I want to be in nature. And so that's where T comes in. I think the T video has the best cinematography and the best, you know, uh, locations filmed. Um, it shows her starting out underwater, coming up, taking the crown upon her head as it belongs, marching from the coast deep into the forests and, you know, proclaiming her sovereignty there before she returns back to the ocean. A backwards march, my back against meadows of fear where it all began. And there's a hunt for the savior whom and the purest of hearts let their spirits be consumed. There's a new world laid at your feet. We build an army from nothing. We raise our children to the beat of its comforting, pounding love. It's, there's a little bit more of a utopian idealism to this song and its lyrics. Behind all insecurity, there is a wall of assurance. She is our own worst enemy. She fights her battles for no one. We have no lives to sacrifice. She makes a sin, dampens the cries. If there's a want for something new, you might find me at the start or where it ends for you. Let it sink in for a new beginning. You know better now. Water fills her lungs and she's inhaling. You feel better now. Underneath the stars, her body's sinking. You do better now. 
a heavy sigh than not sound. This song is the most lyrically rich and there's so much to unpack. Overall, I th again, I get an idea of Mother Earth personified and also a sense of rebirth through trial and dark tribulation. Um, the earth is resilient and it will cry, but it will survive. And our children will survive because of the love that we gave them. The sort of concept of I am, am I, who am I, is sort of embodied in this. Because that statement is basically, you know, a question. Um, like, it's, it's not really a statement. It's sort of just a confused <laughs> sort of um, blurt out of consciousness. And that's sort of what these lyrics are alluding to, the sort of overall existential sort of crisis that this character is trying to understand, or at least I am. <laughs> I love her cute marching backwards and forwards, and then she's on the truck, and there's like copied and pasted all these very kind of classical siren sort of poses as though she's sort of traditional. Like I said, there's an idealism to this track. It's very beautiful. It's very compelling. So like I said, why is probably one of the most head scratching. Um, but like I said, I do get a sense of the old being killed for the new to be born. Um, the beat in why is very infectious. I think it does have a much more uplifting, positive tone to it. I think the key and the the pitch and tone of the song is much more positive compared to a song like Oh, for example, um, in the chorus, where she sings Little Hope, Little Home of Heavenly, come and save us from this ugly truth, sprung from necessity, make good things in life come to you. You know, the mother speaking to her child, um, come forth in this dark world and set us free, be your light. I've seen the truth and it's nothing like you said. I've seen the picture of a perfect world. Now you can touch the air around my cover. So many questions, so many things unsaid. I think that perfectly illustrates what we feel after watching these videos. So many questions, so many things left unsaid. But you know what? That's reality. And that's why I feel like I reach a brick wall whenever I'm trying to really interpret these. I like love talking about it, but I also, I kind of want to stop because I'm like, this is meant to be undiscovered. This is meant to be confusing and confounding to the very end because to be honest that's what reality is um, to get really trippy. It's never going to make any sense um, and I think that these videos are just celebrating that you know. It's what great art does. So then we have like I said we have a sort of change and shift. These next few videos were made in 2011 we have a song called John. Now, I'm not really sure what John means, um, but that's one of the few questions I have. Um, we definitely get a sense of this new character being a little bit more co-opted into a modern environment. She's in this what now appears to be what used to be just a small cardboard castle is now a full-on structure made out of paper and wax and plastic man-made material. She's uh, dancing on a bed of toilet paper. I mean, come on, who comes up with these ideas? This is brilliant. Um, and she is kind of alluding herself to being a prostitute. She has men coming into her room. Um, and the song, John, is one of the more electropop dancey songs. I think it sounds very Ellie Goulding. And she actually looks a little bit like Ellie Goulding when she's dancing on the bed of toilet paper. So I do get a lot of Ellie Goulding, like, lights vibes from that song. And it is very catchy. It's one of the catchier songs. Um, and then Clump features her on a close-up and what looks like her having sex, because she's sort of moving up and down. It's a little bit uncomfortable to watch, but it's meant to be. Um, and at the same time, it shows, I would assume, her child going out into the forest and being kind of set free. So there's this liberating kind of quality to it. And Clump is, again, another straight electro house. These last two songs feel a lot more dance floor oriented. Um, they still feel abstract and unconventional, but there is a little bit more of a pop structure to them makes them a little bit more recognizable. I never dreamt I'd meet someone like you. All unwanted features build the unity of you. But I like you. You see the overall of what we are. Is it sad, sad sight viewed from afar? Why don't you call? Whatever made you into clump like you, the icing cold that leaks out through cracks of you makes us as new. Whenever, whatever made you seem so very small, like you're tiny in real life, but large in thought, who's standing tall? 
Cannot wait until I get my hands on you. We can do the things we said we would. So there's some sexual sort of allurances there. If this is about a love that she never thought she would have with her enemy, this is sort of like a reconciliation. This is sort of like, you know, I can't believe I found you. And I mean, maybe referring to this little clump. I'm not entirely sure what she means by that. Um, again, I have so many questions. And I feel as though I cannot begin to scratch the surface. And the same goes for John. But the very peculiar voyeurism of John and Clump kind of make them their own distinctive sort of set because we do feel like we're viewing something we shouldn't behind closed doors. And even the John video ends with the door closing, um, which does allure to debauchery. And also, but the, you know, the sort of the fortresses of depravity that we humans have built for ourselves. Um, so there's a bit of that cautionary sort of tale mixed in. You know, I would definitely say sonically my favorite songs would be You, Part 1 and Part 2, O, and probably T. They're my favorites, although I also do like Y. I think N and B are interesting, but they don't stand out quite as much melodically. And so they're a little less memorable, though there's still stuff to unpack there that is definitely beautiful. I mean, none of these songs are, as like I said, easily accessible, and that's the brilliance of them. Like I said, I really want to know what you guys think of this series. I, I could talk on and on, but this video is already getting super long, so I'm going to have to wrap this up. But please comment what your thoughts are on these songs and these amazing lyrics, too, that just are so relatable and yet so confounding at the same time. Um, it, it's like you always feel, once you feel like you get a piece of the picture, the picture image reverses and you realize you don't understand it after all. But you thought you did and you were getting closer, you're chipping away at it. Um, but it's pure art. It's just, I love viewing these films. They're so well thought out and you can tell so much work and, you know, it was a cheap budget, but, you know, it was still done very well. Um, so much work and, uh, love were put into these and it just makes me want to make more art. And that's the great feeling that I get from all of these. It makes me want to celebrate the mysteriousness of life and, and nature and humanity and what really it all is about, if it is about anything at all. Um, so um, I am, am I, who am I? You're doing something right. And I wish I had discovered these way back in 2010, but I wouldn't have been ready for it back then. I feel like back then these would have gone way over my head. Um, I was way too much into pop music. It would have just, it wouldn't have had the same impact as it does now. So in some ways it was right timing for me. Um, I have reviewed, like I said, Yona Lee's Everyone Afraid to Be Forgotten, so please check it out. I'll link it in the description. Please give this video a like and subscribe if you enjoy to see more. I am going to review her Kin album and as well as Blue. Those will be coming up soonish. Um, so please stick around for those. I can't wait. Thank you so much for watching. To whom it may concern, peace, love, and light. Bye.